We are out of the book of Nehemiah, and we're going to be, be in the book of Romans, chapter 12, for a few weeks, these first, um, first few verses of chapter 12. I want you to take an opportunity to, uh, to read it today, of course, and take some time to think about it over the course of the next few weeks. Because as we think about the working of God's Holy Spirit, the spiritual gifts that, that He endows Christians, you know, as, as was mentioned a moment ago, for service, for the use here in this body, for the magnification of the kingdom of God and for the glorification of our Lord and Savior. And He, he endows Christians with sp certain spiritual gifts. But before we, we tackle the gifts in verses 3 through 8, I want to today look at Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, which we, we've talked about before, but I want to read all the way through verse 8. So beginning at Romans chapter 12, beginning at verse number 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think uh, him, uh, more of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Let us use them, if prophecy in proportion to faith. If service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does not, or one who does acts of mercy, do them cheerfully. And may God bless the reading of his word. I, I want to ask you a question. It's one that you, I hope, have pondered at some point in time in your life. What is the will of God? I can tell you precisely what the will of God is here today. Precisely. And, and Paul says it, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is the good and the acceptable and perfect will of God. So what is it? What is the good and the acceptable and perfect will of God? His, his will for you, as we read this passage of Scripture, as a Christian, is to present your, your bodies in a very practical and physical manner, continually to live as a sacrifice, one that is holy and acceptable to him. That's that's your that's his will. I mean, really, there are, there are a number of cases in the Bible where we see and hear very clearly where it is defined. This is God's will, and, and so the the question is, what is God's perfect will? What is His acceptable will? What is His good will? And and we'll discuss that today. So, what is it? What does it mean to live in a, in a sacrificial manner? What does sacrificial living look like? And so he defines it a little bit in verses 3 through 8, which we're not going to wrestle with today. But um, so to understand what Paul is talking about here in this passage of Scripture, we need to look before and we need to look after so we have a more clear idea of what he's talking about. You can't take a passage of Scripture um, exclusively on its own. You have to take a, a verse of Scripture in context to really understand what's being talked about. You can't extract it from its context. So what does it mean? And this, this is an ethical question I want to answer for you today. It's a matter of your ethics. It's a matter of your ethics. And so, you, as you wonder what is God's will, have you ever considered who you are in regards to God's will? Uh, maybe, maybe you have, I hope you have, but your, who you are is defined in your personal ethical pattern. I once saw a, a sticker on a car, and this is what it said. I show my individuality by putting mass-produced bumper stickers on my car. And really, it shows this identification 
this pattern uh, of who a person is. And this person was, was tired of people saying they're individuals when they're not, they just are just like the masses. And so, but Paul, what he's calling for here, he's calling for a transformed ethic. He's calling for a transformed life and a transformed individual. That's what he's calling for. And he's calling ch uh, Christians to live in this way. And, and we need to define the word ethic. Ethic is a pattern for living. Your ethical pattern defines who you are. And conformity to the world is what they seem to push. They want you to be just like them. But, but in reality, what, what Christ is calling for as a Christian, he's calling for a, a transformed life. It's the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ that has the power to transform anyone's life, everyone's life. The Christian life is a transformed life uh, which which really helps govern your pattern of thinking and actions. Your ethical pattern should say, I want to please God. I want to live the pattern that I see in the Bible. That's what, what Paul is calling for here. The world tells you to eat, drink, and be merry, live life to the fullest, for tomorrow you may die. And, and for us as Christians, we have a different, different idea. The world says live for the moment. Get it while the getting is good, because tomorrow you may not have it. And, and if all you have is this life alone, then, then that may be a good way to live. But even at that, it's not really a good pattern for living. The Christian pattern is the pattern we should choose. And as Christians, it is the pattern we must live in. See, the gospel transforms lives. And it teaches us to live our lives for the sake of the Lord. That means that your life, who you are, you are to live your life for the Lord. One of the things that, that graduates often struggle with is the question of, what am I going to do with my life? Where am I going to go? What job am I going to take? Who am I going to marry? Well, it, those are good questions, but the real question is, how am I going to please the Lord with my life? That is, the, that is the mindset of the Christian. That's part of what we wrestle with today. The gospel transforms a person's life. And as a result of that, we, we begin to live for the sake of the Lord. And as we will start discussing next week in verses 3 through 8, we do it for the sake of the body. I mean, it matters. We are the body of Christ. And my life is not singularly, exclusively focused on me. My spiritual gift is not for me. My spiritual gift is to be lived out here among God's people. Amen. And yours is too. Yours is too, as we will discover. But Paul, in this passage of Scripture, he, he pleads with his fellow believers. And in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15, 16, it says this, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because, of the, because the days are evil. It says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as unwise, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. It's an evil day we live in. And we need to, in a very practical sort of way, uh, extract our thinking from the world, pull it out of the world, and place it in such a way that we're all we're doing, we sift through God's word. That's what Paul is talking about here today. We need to seize the day. We need to redeem the time. We do need to live life to the fullest. And this, as a Christian, is accomplished through sacrificial living. That is a strange paradox, isn't it? Sacrificial living. That's what Paul is calling for here. Uh, you know, a sacrifice is something that's slaughtered, right? And he says, live this way. Live as though that you're dead. You're living fully for him, fully for God. Under his guidance, under his power, under the governance of his word. You must die daily to self and to selfish needs and ambition. The Christian who understands this, they, they understand that their life matters for eternity. Our lives, uh, I, I've heard it said that, that the Bible means basic instructions before leaving earth. This is what guides us and governs us and helps us on this path. And our lives, they count for all eternity. And you and I, we live our days today with that understanding. So, so Paul is talking about a transformation 
He's talking about a transformed life that comes when we live in this, in this sacrificial manner. And so I really only have a couple of things to say this morning. The first one is this. I know I am transformed when I surrender my life to Him. I surrender myself, myself fully to Him. Paul says in verse 1, I appeal or I beseech to you. And so he's pleading with the Christian. He's pleading so that you would understand what he is describing here, what he is saying. And this is an imperative command. This is, he in his office of apostle is really demanding of the Christian that they understand that they must give themselves as a sacrifice. Paul, throughout the book of Romans, one of the latest, uh, well, what we see in the book of Romans is that it's an ethical and it's a theological teaching. And here he's, he's saying, you've been learning all sorts of things about what it means to be a Christian. This, this is how you do it practically. You live it out in this way. And he does this by the mercies of God because the mercy of God says that he's allowing you and giving you this opportunity for this season of time to serve him well, to use your spiritual gift well, and to yield yourself to him fully. Not of this life, not of this world, but that you would live for him fully. We need to allow the gospel of Jesus Christ to transform us. It's not just mere words that we hear. It's the transformational power of Jesus Christ. It is his message and his word that changes us. See, transformation for you and I, though, it, it flows from a love for and a desire to be like Jesus, to live our lives under the governance of his holy word, under the guidance of his Holy Spirit as he brings those words to mind from the, from the working of his Holy Spirit in our lives. Paul in chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 17, Paul said that the just shall live by faith. And you and I, this is an action and an activity that's powered by faith. Faith is real. We sometimes think that faith is some nebulous term, but faith is real and it's lived out and it's practical. And our pattern of faith can be seen in all that we do on a regular and a daily basis. Faith is applied in our daily life. God's mercy is shown through this action of redemption. And he draws us into this relationship with him. And then he compels us to live for him as though we are a living sacrifice. You see, every what Paul is saying by the mercies of God that every believer, every Christian should surrender their life, their life through faith, living in a way that honors him. Paul is instructing the readers here to present their bodies as an offering on the altar of God, to present your life, your being, and who you are. I mean, the question really needs to be asked, do you live in a sacrificial manner? This morning in Sunday school, we talked about childlike faith versus childishness. And if we're childish, we live for ourselves. And that's contrary to what the scriptures teach that Christians should do. We present ourselves to Him. And yes, this, this means we lay ourselves down before Him. For Him to be, uh, for Him to use us as He calls and He sees fit. Confession of sin is vital. But that's not what Paul is talking about here. What he's talking about is a life that displays a, ref a reflection of a love for their Savior, for their Lord. And it's a changed ethic. You know, years ago it was said that, you know, if you were a, a Baptist, you could, you could uh, confess your sin and then live any way you wanted to do. And there was some disconnect in, in the thoughts of people who saw, saw Christians as a whole. And that's just not the case. If you're a Christian, you're going to strive, you're going to desire, and you're going to want to live in a distinctly different manner. We have a changed ethic. We give ourselves to him. But the giving of our lives is not just the, 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 the body physically doing, because we can go through the motions, can't we? I mean, think about that person who might work on a factory line, and, and what they're doing is there's, something's passing through, and they're pulling down the lever and the machine. Uh, they lift it up, and something else is going on. Their heart's not in it, but they're doing the work. 
They're going to get paid for it. What, what we really need is a, a transformed mind so that when, when we're, we're doing whatever we're engaged in for the Lord, that it's coming from a heart and a desire to please Him. That is what Paul is calling for. Change is impossible unless the will is brought under the subjection of the Lord. I hear people all the time who are struggling with sin issues in their life. And they struggle with it. You know, they say the flesh is, uh, in my flesh is, is overrunning me. And their spirit is weakened. The only way that we can overcome sin and the only way that we can truly live in the way that Paul is calling for here is if we surrender our will to the Lord. Bring that under the subjection of the Lord. So changing your will is a key to transformation. The will is this inner desire that motivates actions. God wants the will because the body sometimes just sort of goes through the motions, just does the things you're supposed to do. What God wants is a real transformed heart, transformed mind, transformed life that comes from within and not just the activities because somewhere along the way in the pulling down of that lever, you get tired and you fall and you succumb. But the individual who has a will that is surrendered to the Lord truly can make a change. I mean, some really treat their faith like it's a job, like it's something that just has to be done. Their Christian faith with no enthusiasm. You see, our bodies can do all the good and right things and live in an ethical and a moral way without having a transformed heart. What Paul is talking about here is a transformed heart. I like this illustration. I'm, you've heard it before. But there is the story of a little boy who was being extremely difficult for his babysitter. She would say, do this, and he would do that. She would say, go here, and he would go there. You, you know the child I'm talking about. You may have one. The little boy was standing up in his chair, and he was hollering and shouting. And, and she just finally got tired of it. She said, sit down. You know that tone that, that a babysitter or a mom gets, just sit down. And the boy just started jumping louder and hard, harder, and he was hollering. And this babysitter became so angry that she finally yelled at the top of her lungs, if you don't sit down, I'm going to sit on you. And so the boy just got louder. And finally, the babysitter, in a very, I'm sure, loving manner, picked up the child, put him on the floor, and sat on top of him. And she said, see? And the little boy looked at her, up at her and said, yeah, but I'm jumping around on the inside. <laughs> you see, that's, that's oftentimes what we do. We... We may bridle something. Someone may bridle something around us, but all the while our will has not been changed. It has not been transformed. And that is something we, we as Christians, we grow into and we yield it to the Lord. We yield it to Him. You see, that babysitter, she captured the body, but the will was untamed. And we need God's Holy Spirit working in our lives to control us. This is the practical understanding of what it means to live the Spirit-filled life. Allowing God's Holy Spirit to guide, reprove, correct, convict, and help us live in a manner that brings honor and glory to the Lord as Christians. In a practical way, it means we willingly place ourselves at God's disposal to use as He sees fit. That's why we see verses 3 through 8 on the following, on the coattails of this teaching. It reveals some of the spiritual gifts. And every Christian, when you meet Christ as Lord and Savior, you have a spiritual gift. And this passage of Scripture, it makes it very clear that this spiritual gift is something that God would have you to use within the confines of the body of Christ first. And yes, we, we use it outside, but... If, if we're talking about the fact that we are the body of Christ, you have a spiritual gift, it, it is inevitable, it is, is vital that you use your spiritual gift for the sake of the body, for the sake of the church. You see, every Christian has been given a spiritual gift. And what Paul is telling us, what he's challenging us here to do, 
is to be willing to give them to the Lord to use as he sees fit. See, Paul further challenges us to willingly surrender our lives to God. It is the responsible response to what he has done. It is, uh, we see it here, it is our, our act of, of spiritual worship to yield ourselves to him. Do you want to know how to really worship the Lord? It, it doesn't come through a song that you sing or, uh, I hate to say it, even a sermon you may hear. It comes as you spiritually worship before the Lord. And yes, all these other things, they matter. The songs we hear, the, the teachings we hear, the sermons we hear, they all are incorporated into this. But this is a component we need to understand as yielded individuals. This is, this is required of us to yield our will to Him. See, the highest reason to serve the Lord is because He's redeemed us. Because he saved us. Because we belong to him. But he wants us to do this in a willing manner. That's why he appeals that you will it really, by the mercies of God, yield yourself to him, to the Lord. So I am transformed when I surrender my life and my spiritual gift to him. Secondly, I am transformed when I no longer allow the world to shape me. That's the other issue in this passage, or one of the other issues in this passage, is passage of Scripture. See, the ethic of a person, it follows the desire of a person's heart. You live out the pattern of your ethic. You may, you may say this, but if you do this, it's another thing altogether, because your, your pattern for life describes and defines who you are. Kenneth Weiss says this about this idea he said, we need to habitually be ordering our, your behavior within the sphere and by the means of the spirit, and you will positively not fulfill the desire of the flesh. So as you begin to yield yourself to the Lord, as you begin to allow him to work in and through you, and you lay yourself before him for use, you will not fulfill the desire of the flesh. It comes through a yielded heart. And I say that in every one of us in here on a regular and on a daily basis we need to confess our sin because every day we miss it. This is, this is the, the, the paragon. This is the point at which we're striving for. And you and I are on this journey in which we strive every single day to live this way. And we do this as we refuse to allow the world to shape us. We, we have a transformed mind. See, Paul says, no longer uh, be pressed into the mold of the world. He says, do not be conformed. That's this idea of pressing. Uh, have you ever seen these little uh, uh, toys? You, you get them at the gumball machine, or you used to get them. I don't know that they're still available. And you, uh, you put in, I guess nowadays, you put in $10 or something to get one of these things. I'm not sure. But you put in your money, and this thing comes out, and you take it home, you throw it in some water, and this little ball blows up into a, a car or something, you know. It's just something enormous. But there's this idea of being compressed. That's the idea that Paul is using here in this passage of Scripture. Uh, it's easy for the, the world to press us in and to mold us in such a way. It's easy for the world to crush us down. And so Paul is saying, don't be conformed to this world. Don't be pressed in by the mold of this world but be conformed to Christ. Be changed and transformed by Christ. You see, when God saves us, He redeems us from the old pattern and the old way of life. And it takes some work in, on our, in our Christian life to, to start thinking differently. We call this the process of sanctification. It is a, a change that goes on. We grow and we become more of what Christ would have us to be, what God would have us to be like. So when God saves us, he redeems us from this old pattern. The benefits of a, of a mold is that they all come out the same. They really do. I mean, when that thing comes out of the machine, you really don't know what you've got. I mean, you do because you see the label, but you really don't. And the idea is for you and I, we're to be molded into the image of Christ, more like our Savior, more like Jesus Christ more giving, more surrendered, more willing to serve the way he desires us to serve. 
The world teaches to look out for number one. The Bible teaches to look out for each other. The world teaches to love evil, and the Bible teaches to assuage or, or hate evil. The world teaches to do the minimum, but the Bible tells us to give our best. Paul says to be transformed. And this is this idea of metamorphosis or, or renewing or renovation of the mind. Uh, I think one of the most popular kind of television shows right now are these renovation shows. And you go into it, you see the person calling a general contractor and, and they say, I want to make this bathroom larger or whatever. And I want to do my kitchen this way. And so you see this general contractor, he goes in and he starts demolishing things. You can hear the hammer. And as he starts tearing away the walls and starts tearing away things, he gets in there and every single time beneath the surface, it's always worse. It is always worse than he imagined because there's this dressing, this window dressing that has probably been painted over time and time and time again. But as the general contractor goes in and he starts ripping this stuff out, he realizes work is not as easy as he thought it was to begin with. Well, this is the idea of renewal, renewing. This is the same principle here. Sometimes in the process of this, there's some tearing out. And, and when we think it's all torn out, we get in there and we go, man, do you, do you see this, this mold in here? We've got to cut this section out. Wow, this I never would have known. It smelled a little funny, but I didn't know. Look at this insulation. It's, it's black. And so you've got to pull all this stuff out. And you've got to redo the drains. You know the story. Because it's, all of this is hidden behind the scenes. And there are things that aren't quite as obvious until that contractor gets in there and starts demolishing the walls. And you say, oh, what a terrible, terrible uh, problem we have. Well, that's how our spiritual lives are oftentimes. They look good on the outside, but all the while you start ripping away at it. And it's always more expensive. It's always more costly. It always takes more time. And it always hurts a whole lot worse than we ever imagined. And that's what this idea here of renewal is. Re renovation. Renewing. And, and Paul is saying, do the hard work and renovate your mind. Renovate your thinking. Renovate that mind of yours. And then this transformation is this word metamorphosis. And you know, you've heard this illustration before. It's nothing new. This is the idea of a metamorphosis. It's this cocoon and butterfly or caterpillar uh, that, that turns into a cocoon that turns into a butterfly. And this is the idea. It, it's kind of, it, you know, this, this caterpillar goes into this state. There's stuff put all around it. And eventually it comes out a beautiful butterfly on the other side. So, so sometimes there's a transformation that takes place. And it's God's work in our lives. It's God's work in our church. It is Him who does this work. You and I, we're just, we're just tools in His hands. We're just spiritual gifts that He uses. We are people He uses to accomplish this. But what Paul is talking about here is this renewal of our mind. We're to guard the portal of our mind. It's the place where all of our battles are won and lost. You want to know how to live your Christian life? Bring your mind under the subjection of God's Holy Spirit. Bring your mind under the, under the subjection of the Word of God. Bring your mind under the subjection of the Lord, and you will win the battle. It's the place where all of our battles are won or lost. It's here in our mind. Even, even things that are thrust upon us. See, if the devil wins control of the mind, he easily conquers us. So we, we guard with all diligence. And this idea calls for a new way of thinking, a new way of living, a new thought pattern. And we, this is governed and guided by this mold, by this being conformed not to the world, but being transformed into the mold of Christ, becoming more like the Jesus we read about in the scripture, becoming more like the individual that the word of God teaches. That's what Paul is calling for. He's calling for us to have a transformed life. You see, we, in our transformed mind, we must not toy with the thoughts of sin. One of the reasons we struggle with sin, with sin is because we, we toy with the idea. We don't lay it to rest or confess it or ask the Lord to help us at those times. All of us are guilty. I mean, we can talk about the depravity of, of sinfulness, you know, lust, 
But, I mean, there are other areas that we sin in. I mean, what about our tongues? We need to bring those under the subjection of God's Holy Spirit and His Word. What about our thought life? Yes, we need to bring that under the pattern of thinking that Paul is calling for. All of our actions and all of our deeds can really be lumped into a couple of different categories. Category one is honoring to the Lord. Category two is honoring to the devil. It's either honoring God or you're honoring the world. You're either being conformed into the image of Christ or you're being uh, you're still in that mold of the world. And Paul is saying, he's beseeching us to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. Don't be conformed to this world in this way of thinking, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind through God, through Christ, through his word. You see, Satan, he lures us time and time and time again. It's kind of like, if you have a cat, you know this as well. You know, you, you take a, you know, we've got this little red light thing that you push it and it, uh, this red light goes all over the place and the cat just goes crazy. You know, and every now and then you'll let the cat catch the red light. You know what they discover when they hit the red light? There's nothing there. It's empty. And time and time again, this stupid cat falls for the same trick. And time and time again, you and I we fall for the same tricks over and over and over again. It's time for you and me. It's time for us to live with a renewed mind. It's time for us to no longer be to, to no longer be conformed to this world, but to be conformed to the image of Christ. It's like that little red dot. There's no pleasure in the mouse or that, that cat when it, when it thinks it's catching this red dot. There's no pleasure in that. Oh, for the moment as he's chasing it, he thinks he's going to win some valued treasure, but it's always empty every time. There's no sin in that red dot. There's no sin in the plastic mouse. That's why we need to guard the portal of our minds because our our minds are where the word begins. I remember my philosophy professor, Dr. Stewart, and he asked the question one day in seminary. He asked the question, is there a difference between a garbage dump and a person's living room? Well, you know, the obvious answer is yes, because you don't dump garbage in your living room. You want to keep it clean and swept. You want to keep it uh, available for company. You see, the garbage dump gets everything, but the living room, it, get, it gets things that are selectively placed there. See, our minds should be more like the living room, he said. We should selectively place what, what belongs there. There's this expression every computer person knows. It's garbage in, garbage out. If you put a, a good piece of garbage into your computer in a program, it comes out garbage. And if you and I, we put garbage in our mind, garbage in our thinking, then what comes out is garbage. And so Paul is calling for a transformed mind. And you and I, as the children of God, we have a mandate. He pleads with us to renew your mind, to bring it under the subjection of God's holy word. Allow his Holy Spirit to govern us and guide us, not, not fighting, not balking, but embracing what God demands from you. We must reprogram the hard drive of our mind. Our ethics should change because of a changed life. As a non-Christian, you can live any way you want to because you're going to please the Lord of your life. You're going to please the devil. But as a child of God and as a Christian, as we're talking today, you must yield your thinking to him. Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may be able to prove what is a good and the acceptable and the perfect will of God. What is the perfect will of God for, uh, 
Uh, God's will for your life is to live with a transformed heart, transformed mind, a transformed ethic, living for Him. Not to be conformed to this world, but to be like our Savior. So how do we know? How do I know I am transformed when I no longer allow the world to shape me? So what does living sacrificially actually look like? Well, according to Paul, and in the context of this passage of Scripture, you're, you're striving to live like, like your Savior. You, you live for others. You live for the body. That's the church. You give your service to God and to the church. That is God's perfect will for your life, to serve Him well, to serve Him as a member of the church, to do the, the things He's called you to do and use your spiritual gift here. That is what we're required to do. So the question we need to ask ourselves today, has the gospel really changed me? Has the, the gospel of Jesus Christ really changed me? Well, let me tell you something. This is how you know. If you're living in the way that Paul describes here, I mean, can real change be brought about in any person's life? I've heard the stories. You've heard stories of testimonies of how God has just redeemed this person. They got saved. They were regenerated. And they were in such a, in such a place that their lives were totally different, completely different. People didn't recognize them anymore. That's the evidence of a changed life. That's the evidence of Jesus Christ taking a rotten sinner who has been crushed by the mold of this life and the mold of this world, and he brings them in and he brought, brings them into this relationship and he changes that individual. That's the evidence and it's a changed life. Can the gospel really transform and change you? Well, yes. That's what Paul is talking about here. You and I, we renew our mind. We, we become more sanctified in this process. We become more like our Savior. And hopefully, you are growing more like your Savior today than you did yesterday. Uh, years ago, there was a book, One Step Forward and Two Steps Back, and that seems to be the pattern for Christian living. But at least you're pressing forward. You continue to push forward a step at a time, striving to please the Lord. What is this transformation? Can the gospel really transform a person who's saved? I, I think that's true if we yield this, this life of ours to Him in this process of sanctification. Can the gospel really transform a person? Can it, can it change a person from from uh, who they were to somebody new. Yes, every single instance. I could, I could call you up here one at a time, and I'm not going to, don't worry. I could call you up here one at a time, and you could share what Christ has done to you, how, how you were, how you got saved, and who you are now. And the stories are around you. The stories are in the world around us. It is the transformational power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the only way that we can live this way. And today, you must yield to him. Paul says, I appeal, and this morning I appeal to you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. No longer being conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewal of your mind. Yield your mind to him that by the testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect today of all days, won't you yield to him? As we close during this time of decision, you know, you, you may be struggling with, with something. Maybe you're having a difficult time. Maybe your mind is, is so easily drawn away. And, that's normal. It's a practice. It's a discipline. 
And so this morning, during this time of decision, won't you yield that to him? And maybe today you have never met Christ. Maybe today you heard and understood for the very first time what it means to be a Christian. And during this time of decision, won't you come? Let me walk you through this as you yield your life to the Savior. So today, as we stand and we close in prayer and have a song of decision, won't you yield to him? Let us pray. Father, I pray that you help each and every one of us this day to walk away today, Lord, with a heart and a life and a mind that's been transformed and renewed. Lord, by the working of your Holy Spirit, by the teaching and proclamation of your word, let us yield to you. Father, we pray these things in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen.